I used to leave Tucson in in January and go to the national go to the fat stock show in in uh, Denver, and then I'd be on the road all year long, except for the Tucson rodeo. And I'd go back to the ranch in November, and then start all over again the next year in January. So I was riding. I was getting, I say riding, I was getting on uh, horses and bulls. And so yeah. that's where my name, nickname comes from. The wing was formed at uh, George Air Force Base. And I was originally in the 186 Montana Guard flying 51s. And the Guard was activated, or was deactivated, and the 416th was activated. So I went in the 416th Squadron. And uh, I later was transferred over to base flight as uh, the commander of the uh, instrument school. That's where I was when we went to Europe. We flew the 86s over starting in December, I believe it was, because I can remember spending Christmas in Goose Bay, Labrador. and. Uh, then they periodically jumped the squadrons across to Europe, and the 388th wing was ahead of us. And so we couldn't move a squadron until the squadron of the 388th moved. So the 388th was having maintenance problems moving their aircraft. So Colonel Rowland uh, sent me ahead to Presswick, Scotland with I believe somewhere between 35 and 40 enlisted people and two or three spare J-47 engines. And I sat there at Presswick as the other squadrons went through until the 22nd of February. It took us that long to move those airplanes. And uh, we finally got all the aircraft together at uh, Chamblay. And of course, it was quite a mud hole at that point in time. Colonel Stokes can tell you a lot about that. I, uh, when I got there, I was still in base flight and uh, was running the instrument school and checking people out in the T-33. I later transferred back down to the 72nd Squadron as the assistance maintenance officer. When the maintenance officer left, I took over the maintenance. And uh, as in that job, I also flew all the test tops that were required. And I also had to maintain my proficiency as a squadron pilot, as a mission pilot. While I was doing that, I was still instructing in the instrument school and uh, instructing in the L-20. You know, my background in aviation was, was uh, I graduated from flying school in 1944. And then uh, after the war was over and what have you, why, I flew crop dusters and, and flew different various kinds of aircraft and I was an instructor pilot. So when I got recalled to active duty, I had a lot of flying time. And when I was in the rodeo business, uh, uh, two famous cowboys, one of them was Gerald Roberts, who was the all-around champion cowboy of the world at one time, and the other one was Casey Tibbs. Where we had an airplane together, of which I was flying. Uh, I was in Kansas City, and, and Gerald and Casey were in Cheyenne, and I got a call from them and said, get your butt to, to Cheyenne, you're entered in a bull ride, and we bought an airplane. Interest in Kansas City. So I get the next airplane, I fly to Cheyenne. Uh, that next morning I go, oh, we party that night. The next morning I go out and, and I make about four or five takeoffs and landings in that airplane, which was a twin engine. I'd never flown a twin before. I'd flown four engines, but never a twin. Bucked off two bulls that afternoon. We got in the airplane and flew to Kansas City. 
rode the midnight show in Kansas City, left <laughs> left about four o'clock in the morning, coming to Colorado Springs. Well, and another problem we had when I was over there was the pilots were limited at that time to about 15, 15 hours a month. And uh, I was fortunate in the fact that I was flying all these other airplanes also, so I was always getting anywhere from 60 to 75 hours a month flying. And I loved, and I loved to fly. I didn't feel there was anything I couldn't fly. The one story that they tell about me booming the base is uh, I had a test flight to fly one morning and the airplane was clean. In other words, it didn't have drop tanks on it. We very rarely flew them that way, but in this particular case, this airplane had a, a uh, control surface change, so it had to be test flown. So one of my uh, crew chiefs by the name of Townsend bet me a case of beer that I wouldn't boom the base. <clears throat> so I went up to 40 some thousand feet and rolled it over and put the gun sight on the 72nd hangar and went through the mock, popped the speed boards and backed out, pulled the boards in, went through the mock again. Well, when I came in and landed and they parked me in my revetment, there was three blue staff cars that went by in front of the airplane very slowly. And when I got into operations, I was informed that they wanted to see me up at group headquarters right away. <laughs> so when I got up there, why, Colonel Donovan Smith, who later was the general, uh, says, Cowboy, did you boom the base today? And I said, yes, sir. He said, did you boom it twice? And I said, yes, sir. He said, well, you're sure truthful about it. You know, you could have blamed the French, blamed it on the French. And then he says, I was in the old man's office and this Colonel Baker, and he says there was uh, some people down from headquarters. And when you, when you boomed the base, he says, they must have come a foot out of their chairs. <laughs> so he says, what am I going to do with you? And I said, well, sir, I don't know. All this time I'm standing at attention. He says, well, I guess I'll ground you in the F-86. So I said, well, for how long, sir? Well, two weeks. I says, well, is that just going to be in the F-86 or is it going to be in the other airplanes I'm flying also? No, it's just going to be in the 86. I says, well, all right, sir. But I says, you realize that if you ground me that there probably won't be an airplane that needs a test flight that comes out of my hangar during the two weeks I'm grounded. Oh, he says, you can take care of that. I said, I can try, but you can't put anything over on all those old sergeants. Well, make a long story short, there wasn't an airplane that came out of the hangar. In the two weeks I was grounded, and they even sent uh, Major Auger down to see if he could straighten it out, and he couldn't do it either. But the day I got back on flying status, I had five airplanes to fly. And uh, that night I went to the NCO club with the NCOs and we drank not only that case of beer, but five more. So that's <laughs> the end of that story. I got into a little, little disagreement uh, at George some time before we left. I, I happened to be in a bar looking for a friend of mine. And uh, it ended up that uh, these five people come in and I was in uniform. And they kind of ringed me at the bar and started giving me a real hard time. And there was two sergeants that I knew that was standing over off to the side. And uh, being an old rodeo cowboy, I knew what was going down and going down in a hurry. So the leader of this bunch was standing there with his hands on his hips, kind of sneering at what it. Well, when I hit him, I knocked him clear over the top of a table and just slid him down underneath the shovelboard table. And then I hit two more before they knew what was going on. And the sergeant took care of two of them. And the one guy got up, and I didn't know it, but he had a broken beer bottle. And that's where these scars come from on my face here. So I hit him and 
the last time I seen him, he was on his hands and knees crawling out the front door. In the meantime, the sergeant says, cowboy, you're cut. So I felt my face and sure as hell was bleeding like a stuck hog. So uh, I managed to get back in the car and went to the base and I noticed that the uh, air police were checking everybody real closely when they went, went in. So I made it a point to stare straight ahead and not turn my head at all. So then I went to the base hospital and I called up my uh, stepbrother who happened to work in the flight surgeon's office. And he said, well, he'd come down and look at me, what he did. And then he went, well, I'm sitting there I'm sitting with my right side, with my feet up on a desk, and the door is on the left, and the air police come in, but they don't see anything, and they leave. And then Dr. Palm comes in, and he sews me up. So the next day, well, I happened to tell General Roland, or Colonel Roland at that time, found out about it. So, <clears throat> Roland made the, made the comment, he said, uh, when we get over to, to France, we're going to be in a communist area, so I'm going to have you be my personal bodyguard. But, <laughs> you know, those pachucos <laughs> thought they had themselves just a little, old second lieutenant or first lieutenant yeah. at the time, didn't know what he was doing. But yeah. They got hold of a rodeo cowboy, spent a lot of time fighting in bars. <laughs> One day I led a fighter bomber strike, just two aircraft, myself and another young second lieutenant, only I probably had 300, 350 hours. And we went over and we were beating up this uh, army post of CERN over in Germany. And uh, uh, you used to let different people in your squadron know when you, you met your minimum fuel supply, which was, was bingo on fuel. And all of a sudden, he yelled bingo over the radio. Then I looked at my fuel gauges, and I had all kinds of fuel. So right away, we aborted the mission and tried to go back to, to uh, Chambly. And then the uh, radar sites told us that Chambly went below weather minimums. So then they diverted us to Stuttgart. Well, by the time we got to Stuttgart, Stuttgart went below minimums. So then they turned us around and they sent us to Munich, to First and Felbrook. Well, by the time we got to High Key at First and Felbrook, First and Felbrook went below minimums. Well, there was no place else to go. So they were talking about bringing us down and vectoring us off somewhere into an open area and having us punch out of the airplanes. Well, I'd already punched out once, and I wasn't interested in punching out again. And I suggested that their base commander, or wing commander, whoever he was, call our base and talk to, I don't remember if it was Roland or Baker, and uh, discuss it with them, because I was willing to make the approach. But <clears throat> they brought us down, and uh, well, uh, we made it on the ground. Let's say we pushed those minimums down to, to where I was almost off the end of the runway before I saw the ground. And when I landed, the wingman was right there, right on my wing. Unfortunately, a couple, couple months after I left over there, why uh, he ended up bellying an airplane in up by Stuttgart and, and uh, the seat fired shot him through the canopy and killed him. So that's about all I can tell you about that.